today I wanted to look at the change that's happening in, the, in our industry uh, and how regulation has to adapt to that changing world in order to deliver uh, the best outcomes for customers as we go forward. Uh, I'm going to start off with benchmarking. Uh, the AR has embraced benchmarking for the price setting process for networks. This is about ensuring that the customer pays only the efficient costs and don't have to pay for inefficiency. This regulation is trying to mimic the market. This all makes perfect sense. Um, and I can't help but Skype as I look up there on that diagram. The graph is showing the data that comes out of the AAR's recent New South Wales pricing decision. Uh, the AAR calls out United Energy, City Power Power Core, and SA Power Networks as the benchmarks for all others to aspire to. And so there we are sitting at the, the lowest cost uh, across the industry. Uh, this is real money that's involved in this. Those benchmarks set spend allowances for the New South Wales businesses that require them to cut costs uh, by up to 30% to achieve the benchmark. So first key point is that privatisation in the southern states has clearly been very successful and we're all very proud of being involved in that. But benchmarking comes with a warning. Um, we all aspire to be winners. In the marketplace, those who benchmark well are usually winners. Benchmarking and regulation needs to distinguish between winners and losers. Therein lies the incentive of incentive-based regulation. Based on the AR's own work, as we see on the screen, we expect to be winners in our upcoming price review later on this year. But if the goalposts somehow move and we end up with no winners, where everyone's a loser, then the system will collapse before it even starts. No one will aspire to be on being a loser and the incentive mechanism will fail. Now, while I'm talking about the price review process, I'm very pleased to tell you that the price review submission that we're about to make to the AR, and Paul, I'm telling you, uh, that will see customers in 2016 in our network paying less than they pay in 2015. We're proposing overall price cuts in our coming price review. And I think that's signalling a trend in the industry that we've now got over the hump and prices are starting to come down. <coughs> I now want to paint you the picture of what the future might look like in our industry if we allow it to happen, uh, but then it might just happen anyway in spite of us. This slide paints the picture of how a customer, with, their help, with some help from their innovative energy supplier sometime in the future, on that 40 degree day, might manage their electricity supply. Now I pick a 40 degree day because that's when the, the network is reaching its peak. That's when the electricity system has to work in anger. And that's when the household system in this model will have to work in anger. We build our network to meet the peak that occurs on that extreme hot day, and it's that network capacity that drives the cost that customers ultimately pay. But the peak only lasts for a few hours, and there can be a long time between drinks. We had extreme hot weather stint back in 2009, at the time that Paul referred to earlier, that everyone in this state will remember. And then it wasn't again until January 2014 where our next hot peak load stint uh, actually occurred. So what we end up with was very high intermittent peaks. And when we build our network for very high intermittent peaks like that, the top 30% of the capacity of our United Energy network is used for less than 1% of the time. So we have a problem. It's been well publicised that overall energy, energy consumption is falling, but under our current tariff structures, the peak demand is still growing because the tariffs don't signal the cost of meeting the peak and allow customers to then respond to those price signals. So coming back to our customer for the future, when we look at this, this slide and we go through what the customer from the future might be doing, when we're on top of all these systems, when we've got our, our new innovative energy systems have worked, when we've got the right pricing signals, our customer will be there with his energy management system set to comfy and economy, the solar panels will be working during the day. <clears throat> the batteries will be fully charged overnight, uh, so he can use the batteries then to reduce his peak when he wants all these air conditioners to run in the peak of the afternoon uh, and the early evening. And so the batteries will be working uh, to save that capacity at that time. His energy provider that he's done his deal with will have announced it's a peak day that day, and because it's a peak day, the customer can now sell the capacity from his car from his car battery back into the grid to help relieve the peak further 
and he's getting a financial reward for doing that. So that's the, the system I paint for the future. But all this looks pretty complicated. You might say that no customer will bother. But if it's made very easy, then it won't be a bother at all. If it's me, all I'll do is press the big green button on the energy management system and the system will do that all for me. At the moment, I drive a hybrid car. My wife gave me the hand-me-down hybrid car and I'm there in it and it's lots of fun. Um, that hybrid car makes all this happen. Same sort of things as this that happens in the hybrid car. The car is continually changing between the electric motor, the petrol motor, the battery, and I can actually bring up a display on the dashboard that shows all that happening. It's just continuously changing. Fascinating for an engineer like me, maybe not for others, but fascinating for me. But remember, all I have to do is press the big green button and it does that all for me. It has it all worked out. It's worth noting in this story in our electricity system with our customer of the future that the lines between the retailer, the distributor, the generator and the customer are all starting to blur. When the energy management system is turning things on and off, who's actually doing it? Is it the customer? Maybe it's a retailer. Maybe it's the equipment supplier who's actually programmed all that to make it work. And when the battery is discharging, does that suddenly bring a generator into play? We could spend a lot of time worrying about all of that, but then maybe we shouldn't. Let's now think about who might be the innovator who can pull all this together and offer that package to the customer and make it all work. It might be the retailer. It might be a new energy provider. It might be a distributor who cracks the nut and figures out how to make it all work. But then it might be Google. But let's not preclude any of those parties from taking on the challenge. Let's not create barriers for them. In summary, when I look at what I think the electricity market and grid might look like in the future, a few points come to mind. First of all, the future looks very different from the past. The customer has a whole lot more options and they want to be the ones who make the real choices. Not the central planners, not the economists, the engineers or the regulators, the customers want to make the choices. Second point, we need to reform our tariff structures to ensure that the customers get the right signals to inform those choices for ultimately efficient outcomes. Thirdly, we need to make sure that the old regulatory structures evolve to enable the changing world that our customers seek, not to block it. Looking at tariff reform, as I said earlier, we have a problem with our growing peak demand occurring while overall consumption is falling. The three graphs on the screen there paint the picture of three load profiles for three different customers living in three similar houses, each well endowed with air conditioners. They show the consumption over the 24 hours of a hot day, similar to what I was saying before. If you look at Suburban Joe up there on the top left, um, you'll see that the consumption builds up during the day and peaks about 8 o'clock in the evening. That's how it tends to work in Victoria, certainly in our network area. And that's when everyone's at home, uh, and they're home from work, the air conditioners are pumping hard and trying to cool down the house that's hotted up over the day. All three customers in that slide have the same peak demand. So all need the same amount of network built for them, and that's what costs the money. They all need an equal part of the network to last them on that hot day. But under our traditional tariffs, they pay very different amounts, because those traditional tariffs charge customers according to what they consume across the year, not what they consume at the peak time. Holiday Joe doesn't consume during 10 months of the year when he's not at his holiday house. So his network bill is one third of that of Suburban Joe's. Then there's Solar Joe. His solar panels mean that his electricity bill is greatly reduced with minimal energy drawn from the system during the uh, middle of the day. And you can see the trough in Solar Joe's graph there. <clears throat> um, when Solar Joe sees, oh, if we reform the tariffs, making sure that we signal the cost of the peak capacity to each of those customers, we end up with a much fairer outcome. Suburban Joe will no longer have to subsidise those other customers. And when Solar Joe sees the cost of his peak, what he might do is he might actually go and install batteries, when the prices of batteries have come down a bit of course, but he might install batteries to respond to those price signals and not only he saves, everyone ends up better off in that situation. We end up with a better outcome because we've got the right price signals. 
Tariff reform is a big change and we're getting on with it. The AEMC has landed its rule change. At United Energy, we've announced an optional capacity tariff that's going to start later on this year. But we still have a long way to go. We still need to engage with customers and retailers to explain just how it's all going to work so they can understand the impacts and get ready so we can all best manage the transition and so customers can best respond to the opportunities that the price signals will create for them. I hope that I've convinced you that our industry is changing, that the change is driven by technology, by innovation and entrepreneurism, by the way new product and service options are available to customers, and most importantly, by customers wanting to make the choices between those service offerings themselves. Since the restructure in the industry back in the 1990s that Paul was talking about, the products and services that customers receive have mostly been, genera been determined by centrally planned processes, by regulators and governments deciding what the customers want and then putting that into rules. We contrive markets. We talk of contestability, not competition. We think of there being as one right answer, which is in the hands of the central planner. Each function gets allocated to one party and the rules then tell them how they must do it. If there's a problem with the rules, we fix it with more rules. <clears throat> but now we need to recognise that the customers in the market are taking things into their own hands. The central planning model won't work anymore. We need to recognise that many of the rules built for the old static world won't work in the future. Sure, we know that the price regulation for traditional poles and wires activity will be with us for a long time. It's working, no need to tamper with it. But the rules I'm talking about are those rules that define who does what, and particularly will define who does what in that future world. Where there are new service offerings that are different and optional at the new frontier, let's avoid jumping in with prohibitions and prescription. We need to look at solving problems by removing rules, not by adding them. By enabling, not by prescribing and prohibiting. History is littered with examples of failures where business activities were defined too narrowly, either by the businesses themselves or by regulators. The US railroads saw themselves in the rail business only and not in the transport business, and that caused their downfall many decades ago. There's Kodak. And as Paul mentioned, is Uber about to leave the taxi industry in its wake? <clears throat> to help explain some of the problems in our industry, let me share a few of our recent experiences. First of all, there was our virtual power plant project. We wanted to trial the installation of a combined battery and storage system at our customers' premises. These help deal with the peak load problem. And of course, they give significant benefits to customers in allowing them to manage their consumption and reduce their overall bill. But we came up against the Victorian licensing regime, which was designed in a world that we're now leaving behind. When you consider that each solar panel generates power and the batteries see power flowing in two directions, you wouldn't believe how many generators, retailers, distributors and customers can live on one suburban roof. Uh, noting that each of these services prohibit it without a licence or without some special exemption from on high. Uh, while these narrow definitions of retail generation and distribution may have made sense in the 1990s, these provisions now create significant barrier to innovation and delivering what customers want. <clears throat> Another example uh, is the customer access to meter data. We wanted to provide the customers with their own smart meter data via a web portal so they can better understand their energy consumption. From my perspective, this was about firstly getting benefits to customers from our smart meters and secondly, just good old fashioned customer service for our core service function. From my perspective, this is about delivering customers the benefits that they really want. But the national electricity rules prohibited this outrageous practices of giving customers their own data. Now, we've got through that now, it's now working, but it was a long, slow process to actually sort that out. Each of these examples sees the customer as the loser. They don't get access to the innovative services and products that they're looking for, and ultimately, they're going to pay higher prices if it continues like that. We're about to enter another similar debate as we look at the issues around regulating innovative en energy sellers. 
These are the guys who work on providing alternative funding models to provide customers with distributed generation and storage. So far, they've bypassed the, tradi the traditional retail model and gone straight to the customer behind the meter, a bit like what Uber does. Both the AR and COAG are now looking at what regulation they should apply to these entities. Now, that's fine, but we do need to keep testing the model as things change. I accept that. But we need to start that testing process by looking to see if there's a problem that needs to be solved. For incumbents like us, the temptation is actually to thump the table and demand that the new entrants are handicapped with the same regulatory burden as us to get that level playing field that we all desire. But maybe the better approach is to minimise the burden on everyone and then get the level playing field that way. So all this highlights that it's not just the businesses that need to innovate and change, we also need to think about the way we regulate in the changing marketplace. Regulation must adapt, it must enable, rather than restrict, to ensure that we all deliver the electricity services in the long-term interest of the consumers. Thank you very much.